Hey there, welcome back to our online study of the fruit of the Spirit. Today we're going to talk about gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. So let's pray and we will get right to work. Let's pray if you would. Lord, I ask right now for a blessing on our time in your word, and I pray that what we do together here would be helpful, that it would inspire us to live more like Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, right out of the gate, uh, gentleness is this beautiful reality. It's, it's a, a way about a person, and specifically in, in what we're talking about here, it's this way of Christianity where we are gentle in the way that other people experience us. So the first thing that I want to say is this is the way of Christ. Gentleness is the way of Christ. It's how he describes himself and his ministry. Let me point it out to you in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. This is the words of the Lord himself. He's saying, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When the Lord himself describes his ministry and his own personal disposition, he tells us he is gentle and humble in heart. He tells us that this is how he is. This is how he relates to other people. And you can trace that theme out in, in his personal ministry. You can look at how he deals with the downtrodden. He, you, you can look at how he deals with the ordinary person. And as I've said week by week, I've, I've been pointing out the magnetism of this Christ-likeness. When the fruit of the Spirit is on display in the life of the believer, it actually pulls people to Christ. And in his personal ministry, you saw that as he interacted with all kinds of different people. They found him to be humble in heart and gentle in disposition, and therefore people moved toward him, and he gladly received them. So this is the way of Christ. When we talk about gentleness, we are talking about the way of Jesus. Um, a few weeks ago, I, I mentioned the book by Dane Ortland. Um, Gentle and Lowly. Again, it's worth your consideration. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful book. It's the, the whole premise of the book is taking this concept of gentleness and the way that Jesus deals with um, the, the sinners and sufferers, as the subtitle says, the way that he deals with ordinary people like you and I. Um, it, it is a beautiful thing. So gentleness is the way of Jesus. Therefore, followers of Christ ought to be Gentle. Now, what I want to do today is I want to take you into 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, 2 Timothy is a letter from uh, the missionary church planter, the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to a younger pastor named Timothy, and he's writing about issues of church leadership and eldership and dealing with false teaching and dealing with the best way to kind of organize and and run a church. And so uh, I want to take you there. And before we go there, I want to, I want to um, try to bring you along because some of you would go, you know what? I'm not a church leader. I'm not a pastor. I'm not trying to be an elder. Uh, I'm not trying to deal with, you know, false teachers or think through kind of church structures. So maybe this isn't for me, but I love what Dr. Don Carson says. Um, He's talking about the list of elder requirements, and he says this. He, uh, he says of the list, so if you're thinking about where is that at, it's 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's in Titus. Um, but there are these different lists that say if you're looking to be an elder or you're looking to appoint elders in a church, spiritual leaders in a church, here are the things that, that are required of them. This is the kind of person that you would want to put in that position. And Don Carson says... The list of elder requirements is remarkable for being unremarkable. It's kind of a profound way to put it. What he's saying is, if you look at the list, it's very ordinary stuff. It's basically saying, be a person of character. Be a person who is Christ-like in, in the way that you deal with the world. Now, obviously, there are some unique things to eldership. 
uh, that aren't required of all believers, but Carson is making the point that elders really ought to be an example, a living example of what we expect from all followers of Christ. They need to be the kind of person who, if you're looking at the list, really it's all this character, uh, you know, character qualities that really could be, they're kind of parallels to the fruit of the Spirit. Or, or maybe, another, you know, there, maybe it's just another way of describing what the fruit of the Spirit looks like when it's operating in the heart and life of people. So, what I'm saying is this paragraph has spiritual principles for all of us. Though it's written from a pastor to a pastor about pastoral issues, really the principles here apply to each and every one of us. So let's read the paragraph, um, 2 Timothy 2, verses 23 to 26, and then we'll do four lessons on gentleness from that chapter. Okay, let's read it. Verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments, because you know that they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Okay, four lessons from this brief paragraph. Four lessons on gentleness from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's the first one. Lesson number one, gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. Gentle people, as a matter, matter of policy, so to speak, in the way that they think about the world, they don't engage unnecessarily in conflict. Look at verse 23. It says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. Gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. They're not looking to get into skirmishes with other people. They're not looking for a good argument. Gentle people recognize that a lot of those controversies really are unproductive. John Newton wrote a bunch of different letters. Um, one of my favorites, though, is the letter that he wrote that's titled On Controversy. And I don't have it in front of me and I don't have it in my notes here, but he basically says that controversy is of little value. And the reason why, as he explains it, is because it does harm both to the, the person on the receiving end of it and the person who's issuing it. It really puffs up the pride of, of the person who's issuing it, and it doesn't get well received by, by the other person anyways. And so he's, he points out, man, listen, controversy is of little value. So gentle people avoid it. They don't have anything to do with these foolish and stupid arguments because they know that those produce quarrels. Now, I'm going to say something that's really a, a severe overstatement, but it's, it's worth suggesting. I wonder what the Apostle Paul would think about the, plat the social media platforms that we often use to host our arguments, things like Facebook and Twitter. I wonder what the Apostle Paul would say about uh, those arguments that we engage in there. I wonder if he would say that in general is foolish and stupid. Now, again, I'm, I'm just kind of overstating my case here, but I'm, I'm just wondering, um, well, let me just put it to you as a question. When was the last time that you changed your opinion based off of an online debate? I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but I assume that there's, there's probably not a whole lot of that going on. If you can think of a time, I mean, go ahead and leave it in the comment section. I'd love to hear about it. But it feels to me that often the, the platforms of social media really aren't the, the right environment to engage in healthy dialogue about significant matters. And so gentle people, as a, as a principle, as a way of life, would, would kind of evaluate things and go, look, I don't want to get engaged in foolish and stupid arguments that are producing quarrels. 
I don't want to rush into this combative way of dialoguing with another person that really probably isn't going to amount to much other than frustration and resentment. So gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. Gentle people, lesson number two, gentle people are kind. Now, uh, this shows up in a variety of ways in verse 24. Um, gentle people are, uh, on the one hand, they're, they're not quarrelsome. Look at verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. So we need to be thinking about if we're pursuing this way of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, and this gentleness is becoming evident in us, we want to be the kind of people who are not quarrelsome. Um, when people think about us, we don't want them to say things like they're opinionated, they're, they're uh, brash, you know, they've got these ideas and they're argumentative. That they have all the, these opinions and then they share them in a way that is argumentative, quarrelsome. Gentle people are kind in the sense that they, they don't quarrel. They don't engage in those activities of controversy in a way that, you know, doesn't have anything productive resulting from it. So gentle people are kind and not quarrelsome. They're kind to everyone. Look at verse 24. They're kind to, to all. They must be kind to everyone. The Lord's servant needs to look at other people. And as we've talked about in a previous week, we need to be kind. We need to look at everybody and think about what is in their best interest so that I'm dealing with them appropriately, even when we disagree. They're kind, gentle people are kind in the sense that they speak truth in love. If you look at verse 24, there's a phrase there that says, able to teach. But it's not just an aptitude to teach something. There's this... It, it could come across, some of the commentators point, pointed out, it could come across this ability to teach really is a phrase that could be expressed in this way, speaking the truth in love. So not just the ability to present a persuasive case for something, but doing it in a certain manner. Speaking truth in the way of love. Meaning we're, we're instructing other people we're being kind to them even in the way that we teach because we're speaking truth in love. And finally, not resentful. Gentle people are kind in the sense that they're not resentful. They don't look at somebody who has a differing opinion and roll their eyes and get frustrated by them and think, how could you even think that? And, and, and then begin to despise them and resent them because of the opposing idea. So gentle people are kind. Lesson number one, gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. Lesson number two, gentle people are kind. Lesson number three, this is, you're going to be like, oh, this is, you know, profound stuff, Cor. You're saying what the word means. Here's lesson number three. Gentle people deal with people gently. Gentle people deal with people gently. Look at verse 25. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. You see, gentle people uh, deal with other people in a manner of gentleness. Now, you could ask it like this. When dealing with an opponent, somebody who you have a differing perspective on, do you want to win the argument or do you want to win the person? Because what appears to be happening here in this paragraph is we're being told that there's this principle at play here, that the, the greatest likelihood of somebody being persuaded to come to this way of truth is if you deal with them in the appropriate manner of gentleness. If you deal with them in a harsh and condemning tone, they're probably not going to hear you very clearly. But you could deal with them with gentleness and it could result in their coming to re being granted repentance that leads to a knowledge of the truth. Now, my uh, primary love language would be words of affirmation. I love when people 
speak kind words of me and not just like flattery because that you know you're the greatest dude if it's unsubstantiated it doesn't work for me but if there's something of substance there and somebody is using their words to build me up i feel tremendously loved but there's a shadow side to this as well there's a there's a way in which i can take that love language and and it manifests in an unhealthy way um Love languages, if they're used in the opposite way, can do great harm. You can, you can use them as a weapon. So if somebody speaks harsh words to me or condemning words, I feel that. But here's the part that's on me that's, that's unhealthy. If somebody is trying to correct me and if I'm not in a mature state of mind, if I'm not in a kind of a, a gospeled orientation, um, if I'm not in a place of, of health, if there's an absence of gentleness, I don't feel helped by their correction. Does that make sense? Um, gentleness has this ability to lead people to repentance and a greater knowledge of the truth. But if there's an absence of gentleness, even if you're right, even if you're entirely right, um, it, it might not be well received. We'll revisit this in the next point as well. But gentle people deal gently. At our church, we use a program called Alpha. And uh, it's a program where it's a groups program where people are invited into a safe environment to discuss matters of faith. And it introduces people to the kind of basics of Christianity and one of the main reasons why I love it is because of the training of leaders. So the leaders are encouraged in the training for Alpha, if they're going to be a table host or helper, they're, they're taught, you do not correct people when they share. You don't preach at them. You don't tell them why their idea might be wrong. As a leader, your job is to pray for the people at your table, believing that the Holy Spirit can lead them to a knowledge of the truth. So you ask questions and you listen to what they're saying. And even if what they're saying is totally off base, you validate their opinion and you pray that God would lead them to the truth. Now that is an important concept for small group leaders to embrace. We can be gentle in the way that we deal with people and their ideas, and that can have a greater likelihood of them arriving at truth than if when we hear something that is off or wrong or concerning to us, we begin to preach at them and we begin to tell them why their ideas are wrong or faulty. Gentle people deal gently and it has a great outcome. It has the potential to lead people to repentance and therefore a knowledge of the truth. Here's the fourth lesson. Gentle people liberate others. Gentle people liberate others. Look at verse 26. This is what would happen if you deal with your opponent gently, and it results in God granting them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. Look at how it's described here. That they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. So gentleness has this ability to feel like this liberating reality. If they experience repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and therefore liberation from um, spiritual blindness and captivity to the will of, of the enemy, that's a beautiful thing. That's what gentleness has the opportunity to do. Gentle dealing with other people can be a liberating reality. Now again, if we're harsh or condemning or lacking in gentleness, people might not feel that. They might not experience that. If your opponents don't feel that liberating reality, then are we really doing our Christian obligation? Jesus is telling us here that we can deal with our opponents gently and it can result in their being set free from these faulty realities. And so I believe that that's a, a beautiful pursuit for us. I believe that that's an important feature of how we might do cultural engagement. We need to be a people who are filled with the Spirit and dealing gently with our opponents. And therefore, they are experiencing repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth and release from captivity. 
Well, let me let me just highlight a little warning here because um, I've I've seen how some of you read your Bibles and the things that you underline and get excited about. Um, there's a there's a there's a danger here of reading this paragraph and getting to this final verse 26 and saying, "Look, they're in captivity to the devil." So, Cor, we're dealing with something very significant here. I have to warn them how dangerous and stupid their ideas are. I have to, look, Cor, this is saying they're trapped by the devil. I need to tell them how ignorant they are. Now, I see that too, and I, I agree with you that that's right there in the text. But if we go about it in an ungentle way, we're undermining the entire paragraph. We're undermining what God is actually telling us to do here. We're supposed to deal gently so that they might be liberated from the devil. So we have to be careful not to say, look, the stakes are very high here, so I'm going to go ahead and loudly and passionately tell them how foolish their ideas are. No, our job as Christians is to behave like Christ to have a gentleness about us, to have this ability to look at them with sincerity and, and kindness and a desire for their goodwill and to be able to say, I want what's best for them. I'm going to speak the truth in love and I'm going to have a manner about me that is going to have the greatest likelihood of that truth being well received. So I'm going to stay with this person. And I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to validate them and I'm going to care for them and I'm going to speak the truth in love in gentleness. May we be the kind of people who avoid unnecessary conflict, who are kind to others, who deal gently even with our opponents, and therefore have the ability or the opportunity to liberate people from faulty ideas for the glory of God. May it be so. Amen.